All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started here. Can you guys hear me okay? You guys can hear me okay? All right. All things, a lot of things wrong with this situation for me here. One, I, I wasn't thinking we were going to be in this big room, which I'm not a big fan of. And also, I'm a walk around kind of person, so this is really going to be hard for me. And Chad, too, I think. So this is, a, this is going to be a bit of a tag team. Uh, my name is Doug Durham. I'm one of the co-founders of Nebraska Global and Don't Panic Labs. Um, I've been in some so software industry in some way, shape, or form for coming on 30 years now. And then Chad Michael, who's one of our senior lead engineers at Don't Panic Labs, who's been a guy who's kind of been in the trenches at Don't Panic Labs from the beginning over the last five or six years. He's going to do the second half of this presentation talking about some of the details of the strategies that we're going to talk about today. Um, the, uh, I'm hoping to do better than last year. Chad and I tried to do a tag team last year. Um, and I spoke for the first 40 minutes, and I gave Chad about five minutes to talk. So my goal is to only take about 15 minutes here. And then the other thing I want to mention is um, some of these slides have a lot of text on it. Um, I, I encourage you to just kind of don't worry about reading all that, because we'll make these slides available to anybody who wants them. Uh, we did that last year as well. So I know last year a bunch of people were like furiously taking notes and things like that. And I, I probably should have mentioned beforehand that, uh, that we'd make this stuff available to you guys. So today we're talking about funnability, which none of you have ever heard of before. Um, I guess the, the other thing I want to mention is I'm really pleased to see all these people here. When I saw we were at the 3.30 spot, I thought we were going to be speaking to an empty room. I thought everybody would be at the bars by now. But I understand they have some sort of a giveaway that's keeping you guys here at the end of this thing. Is that why you guys are still here? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> all right. So funnability. So um, you guys, ho hopefully you'll get a sense of what we're talking about with this today. But uh, that's what we're, this is the topic of discussion here. What we're talking about is what can we do as a product development culture to really um, increase um, the personal fulfillment and joy that developers get um, within an organization. So think back to kind of what got you into software development. Um, we probably all have some similar reasons and maybe some unique reasons. I know for me, when I, I wasn't actually classically trained as a software engineer, I, my background's electrical engineering. So my first experience with software was really as a systems engineer. I wasn't actually writing the software, but I was, I was really overseeing the software development as part of a, a larger effort. And the thing that struck me almost immediately was we'd be talking to a software developer and we'd say, hey, we want to change this thing. And he's like, great, I got it, I'll go back. He'll go work on it for an hour or so, comes back and demonstrates it to me. And I'm like, this is pretty cool. You get the, like this immediate return on your investment in this thing. I don't know why it never occurred to me that that might be a, a, a cool experience and a cool field to, to focus in in my education. But that really resonated with me. And I suspect that there are a lot of people here who also had a similar experience. The other thing that I've always thought was really cool about it <clears throat> is we, um, we can do things with software that can automate things, that can process and synthesize information, perform workflows that humans really aren't very good at doing. And I always thought that was really cool because it was, it was something that I can kind of offload stuff that I'm not very good at doing and have it do all that hard work for me. And it doesn't care if it's doing a lot of repetitive work or anything like that. And then it comes back to me when it needs my input. And I always thought that that was a cool thing. And I think probably you guys, maybe as you're thinking here, have thought about some of the things that that got you into software development. I, I'm sure some of these probably are on your list. We all had different reasons for getting into it. The problem is, on the, if, you, if you've been in this industry for any length of time, and you've been on this journey to try to realize some of those things that got you into software, you've probably realized that along the way, you've had to experience a lot of pain uh, in that process through your job. Um, and cool office spaces, while they're really nice to have and we really value those, is really sometimes not enough to overcome that. And so to think about what are some of the painful things that you experience during your job. Here is certainly not an exhaustive list. Um, there's a lot of things, whether it's worrying about the release going out and just wondering when the support calls are going to light up and start calling me uh, to figure out what's going on. or just trying to figure out, being, being asked to add a new feature, a capability, a system, and having to take four, six, eight hours, I don't know, a couple days, trying to wade through the code to figure out what's going on. 
all that stuff is the pain that, that I'm talking about. You know, what? I think we realize that no job is perfect, and, and it's, there's probably some amount of pain that is probably to be expected. Um, we'd like it to be this. I'd like it to be mostly the stuff we think is fun, and I'm okay if there's a little bit of that stuff that I, that I loathe. I think the re reality for most people, though, in many situations, is it looks more like this. We have, we have some of that fun, but my gosh, it just seems like it's, we're slogging through a lot of these repetitive, kind of painful things within our culture, within our processes, within our code base, whatever, uh, that really has, for me personally, and for a lot of the folks that helped form Nebraska Global and Don't Panic Labs, it was beginning to really wear on us, and we thought there's got to be a better way. So how do we turn this around? Well, we'd, I've been working, the people at Don't Panic Labs and Nebraska Global, we've been together, most of the senior people have been together for 15 years, and, and this is something that we talked about for much of that 15 years. Um, but when we started Nebraska Global six years ago, we made a concerted effort to say, hey, we're not burdened with any, anything here. We can do whatever we want. We can, we can decide. We can take some time and figure things out. We have some room to kind of think here and do some research and really kind of uh, put a lot of emphasis into developing a culture to try to remove some of that pain or minimize that pain and really try to increase the, the amount of fun and pleasure and enjoyment we get out of doing our job. And that's what we call funability. And I would credit Chad with the, the term there. And that's just a play on kind of the other illities that you think about, scalability, maintainability. So funability is something we actually talk about and have talked about quite a bit over the last six or seven years, trying to make sure that you know, we're thinking about how we're doing things in a way that keeps people really engaged in, in, in our culture, in our company, in our software. So what contributes to funability? What are those measures that um, we feel are important in our culture that, that help us manage funability? Well, we've identified seven of them here, and I'll talk about them all individually, and they're not really in any particular order. The first one would be frequent delivery of value to customers. So this, I think this speaks to a lot of people who are in kind of a continuous deployment, agile environment. This whole, we, used, we came from an environment where we were doing releases maybe three times a year. Um, and when you build up that much code over that amount of time and, and try to pull it all together and do a single release, it, creates a lot, it can create a lot of pain. So we found that if we can, we can uh, increase the, the, the frequency of how often we're providing value to customers, that, that definitely helps quite a bit. The other part is being part of a team. Um, and I mean, this may seem obvious, but really kind of um, trying to create an environment and to try to create what we called in the military this esprit de corps, this pride of being part of this team and this fellowship. And I think what that creates is this mutual accountability between the members of the team. And it has allowed us to not really have, we have no managers or management, if you will, at Nebraska Global. The teams manage themselves. Um, in terms of just trying to keep people accountable. And I think that creating that autonomy and, and that kind of mutual accountability amongst your team members really kind of helps motivate people and, and keep people on the straight path. Um, maintainability of the system. This is kind of a big one, right? So this is our ability to get in there and really just understand the code or just effectively debug the system or try to figure out how to make changes without creating kind of unintended consequences. I'm sure we've all written some code and we're certain it works, you put it out there and all of a sudden something happens somewhere else and we're like, holy crap, I didn't realize that was gonna impact that. Those are things that, to try to be avoided. Creating another, one, another big one for people I think is where you have one or two people work on one part of the system and maybe one person work on another part of the system. They're the only ones who know how that system works. So now you've created a silo of design. It, it doesn't, we have, they, they use their own programming model for even how they put that software together. Well, anybody else has to get in there. I know we've all felt that. Effective management of technical debt, and this doesn't mean elimination of technical debt. It just means, hey, have a process or have something in place that allows us to recognize, first and foremost, that we are assuming some technical debt here. Uh, it may not always be obvious uh, unless you know, you've, you've done some other things like I'll be talking uh, later in terms of software design and, and being consistent there. Um, trying to identify tools that are valuable to you to try to help you recognize 
when you are going down a path that is, that is going to cause you problems potentially later on. And then maybe more importantly, put, putting yourself in a position where you'll be able to come back later and effectively um, remove that technical debt without creating a whole another set of development efforts and problems there. Consistent quality of product releases. I know this was, um, two aspects of this was really a killer for me in the, it, back in the early 2000s. One was the thing I alluded to earlier where you do this release and then you're just on pins and needles for the next two or three days. You know, if anybody here's worked on anything that was either 24 or seven or kind of mission critical, you're just sitting there waiting for something to go wrong. Um, or, you know, just, I, there was three years I couldn't really leave, uh, be in a place where I didn't have internet access in my laptop because I was doing support of this e-commerce system all the time. That was a nightmare. Um, and then the other, the, the second part of this is that have you ever gone on some sort of a, a, a march to, to create a feature set for a release and you're like, we're feature complete this week and it's yet another four weeks before it actually got released? You know, that's what we'd call this stabilization phase where you spend all this time just trying to make sure we've done all the feature development, now we're just trying to make everything work together. Uh, that is also another impact, a huge impact to fundability. Productivity and efficiency of developers. Well, we talked a little bit about this last year and Chad will talk about that again here. There are things we can do to really make our developers um, more productive more efficient in how we kind of um, manage the projects they're in to try to remove some of the mental burden that they have to deal with. Um, and also giving people enough time to actually get in the problem and work rather than just constantly dragging them from meeting to meeting or causing distractions. And then finally, sound software design. Um, this maintaining some sort of consistency in the conceptual design of your system. And actually then using that same programming model or design paradigm across your entire platform. Um, that, that is what enables uh, flexibility and movement of developers around. That's what prevents these silos of design. Um, trying to, that it, can, it will encourage simplicity over cleverness. Clever software, complex software is not very maintainable. It might be fun to write once, but somebody else coming in there and maintaining it and trying to figure out what's going on, it's a bit of a nightmare. And I would say, you know, all these things are kind of, everything I'm talking about is kind of like foundational to what we do, but I think if, if there was any sort of bedrock to what's, what we're doing and any sort of major enabler across all the different things that have really increased kind of the funnability of what we're doing here at Don't Panic Labs, it's been this whole emphasis on software design. It's really unfortunate, just as a sidebar, that this is not stressed more, more in our undergraduate education. I would, I would bet that nobody here had a class in their undergraduate that was titled software design. It just doesn't happen. So you might say, uh, could, how much of this could be, could be uh, how much of this fundability factor could be impacted by cool office space and agile processes, which I imagine many people here are using agile processes in their environment. Well, cool spaces are definitely important. I'm not gonna tell you they're not, and I think we actually have a pretty cool office space where we're at. I mean, it creates, it, it increases socialization, it increases collaboration, it makes it easier to recruit people. Uh, it just makes for a more playful environment. It gives you flexibility to be able to reorganize your teams. Um, so it, that's important. I don't, want to, I don't want to just dismiss that. And agile methods are essential. Um, I'm a big believer in this, and I, you know, I think we've been kind of, we've dabbled in this for the last probably 10 years, but for the last six or seven years, we've been pretty devoted to this. And it's not, we're, I'm not talking about some ideological religious devotion to a particular methodology. I'm just talking about the principles around uh, agile processes. We adapt them to our, fit our own needs, as, as I suspect you do there. The problem is that agile processes are just not a silver bullet because they, they just can't help us deal with the ever increasing essential complexity of the software problems we're trying to solve here. You know, we're doing, at, down at Nebraska Global, we're creating computer vision algorithms that track patients in a bed and try to prevent them from exiting the bed and falling. Um, we've done stuff for weight, for weight lifting using computer vision. We've got software that helps manage infrastructure in cities. These are complex problems. And I'm sure everybody here, most everybody here is dealing with some really complex things. The types of stuff we were trying to solve with problems 15 years ago seems trivial in many ways to what we're trying to do today. And so agile processes are important, but they're not enough. And that's what Chad's gonna talk about. 
So don't worry about this, you're not gonna be able to read this, but, but what, what I've done here is across the top here are these seven elements of this funnability uh, culture that, we have, that we've tried to develop. And then alongside here are maybe the strategies we've used to try to, um, to, try to address those. And you can see I, what I've got there, if you could read it, is uh, we've got cool spaces and agile methods. And you see they, they do contribute, but there is some big gaps there. And so I will ask Chad now to come up and talk about some of these strategies. Last year, he claims he gave me um, 10 minutes. It had to be more like two, um, which has probably been better for the audience. So lucky those people last year, not lucky for you. Um, now I'm going to talk through a lot of the things we do that we think improve the fun ability um, of working for Don't Panic Labs or um, Nebraska Global Properties in general. I've spent a lot of my time on Beehive, not Don't Panic Labs, but I've been um, a lot of places there. Um, and one thing I do want to say is we, I don't think we think we have it nailed. I think we view this as kind of a continuum. We continue to get, try to get better at this. We continue to revisit what we are doing. Is it making things better or is it making things not better and try to get better. This is kind of where we're at now, but I assure you if you talk to us a few years from now, we'll have some new items to add to this list. This has kind of been a concept many of us have had for a long time. Most of us really enjoy writing software and we enjoy working on teams. Um, of people, of people of lead engineers, QA people, um, uh, project managers, project owners, and even UX people. We, we really enjoy working with all those people. I, I said that just cause so someone can make fun of um, Bob later. Um, the, I think a lot of us like working together. We like working on teams. We like working um, with people. Um, but how do we kind of maximize that so every day we come in and want to work and want to work with these people, want to work with these people better? We're going to focus on two roles in particular that can have a huge impact on this. I don't think these are the only two roles that can have an impact. I think all of these roles we have listed here play an important part um, in improving the fun ability. I mean, part of it is just you got to have that sense of everybody on the team really wants to have a good time at work. If you have someone that wants to hate work, they can hate work. Um, a lot of organizations, including ours, often on an individual project, um, especially if it's large enough, has like a notion of a lead engineer that's trying to kind of like guide the software um, to completion. Um, that's a common across a lot of organizations. We tend to call it more of a lead engineer role, which we tend to think has the same um, uh, Thoughts about a developer, we try to, put the, try to put the term engineer on it, not just a developer, not just someone slinging code or not just a programmer. We want people that are really thinking through the design of the system. Uh, we want them to have the good, um, the qualities of a good engineer, but we also want them to have the qualities um, of a real engineer looking through, doing the design of the system overall. Almost all organizations, their lead engineers probably working with the junior, junior engineers. Uh, and, um, don't, uh, what I believe is essential for, for the fun ability is we really d do need people spending time mentoring these other engineers. It's just not helping them get their Visual Studio or whatever environment set up and running away. I mean, really all of us have done that, got their Visual Studio set up and ran away. But I think it has to be more than that. And many of you out there right here, since you're at this code camp, you probably are, in many cases, the lead engineers of your organizations or lead engineers on individual projects. You really have to take these roles um, very serious and um, try to do your best at them. And one of those is coaching your uh, members of your team. You have to try to um, build them up. That won't just have an impact of a better system. That will make everything more enjoyable for everyone. If everybody's um, if it's a train wreck every day at work, no one's going to have a good time. Um, the other thing our lead engineers do, and I think this is essential for the fun ability, is that lead engineer needs to be responsible for maintaining that conceptual design of the system. Someone has to be looking out for the big picture. Are we headed to the right direction? Are we headed to the right goal? And that's something that in DPL our lead engineer is responsible for. We also uh, kind of put on the shoulders of the lead engineer, ensuring that our uh, products perform well. That's a role that I think 
many organizations kind of have some notion that someone's going to do it. But if, I assure you, if, if you don't tag someone as being responsible for something, it's probably not going to happen. It will probably fall away. And then two years later, everybody will be wondering, why does my software take six seconds to load anything? You've got to tag someone for that early on, and that person has to take that responsibility seriously. And they have to have time to take those responsibilities seriously, all these responsibilities. And the other one is, um, something that's been really enabled for me personally by GitHub. I'm a huge GitHub fan, mostly just because of the pull request model. Um, but you have to make sure your engineers are testing their code. And the code reviews are kind of like the way I do that myself. Is when they write in some code, write, uh, add in some, some, some new feature or do something, first thing I'm looking for is, oh, yep, there's some code here. Is there some tests to go with that code? If there's not, it's pretty easy to reject that pull request and please add some unit tests. That's not capable in all areas of all systems to write unit tests, but I think in most areas it is. The other essential role um, at Don't Panic Labs is our project managers. Um, we have Todd and Lori that do this role. This is a role I would not want to do myself. Um, just saying that, and some of you are probably project managers out there as well, but I do think the project managers are essential to fun the fundability for everyone else. Um, I don't know if they find it fun, but I mean, it's one, I think uh, I always find Todd and Lori to be great advocates for just um, maintaining sanity on um, projects. But they also keep track of all these little details so the rest of us don't have to. Um, I have a pretty good memory, um, at least as long as it does, you don't ask me to spell anything. I can't remember how to spell a single word almost. Um, but I have a pretty good memory of stuff. But at Don't Panic Labs, I don't really have to use it. I can, when I'm working, I work on whatever that list of tasks says, and I work on that, and I don't have to really worry about all those other little gotchas. I don't have to worry about this other little requirement. Todd's got that covered for me. And having that confidence in another member of your team has kind of got that um, li a list of all the things we're supposed to be working on covered takes a huge burden off the, um, off the engineers and the lead engineers on projects. This was one, yeah, as I say, kind of we evolve as well. Um, early on in the days of Don't Panic Labs, um, we were actually not doing this one, and we really felt it. This is one where kind of early on, people were just scheduling meetings willy-nilly. Oh, we need to, let's, let's just have another meeting to do this. Let's have another meeting to do this. And really quickly, we got to this um, uh, spot where as engineers, we were working on something for 30 minutes and we were walking away, coming back to another meeting, and it seems fine. You go like, oh, you have an hour here to work on something, or you have a half hour here to work on something. What difference does it make? I assure you, you change your policies around scheduling meetings, give your engineers nice four-hour blocks to work on stuff, they will be more productive, they will enjoy what they're doing more, um, and you'll get better software in the end. Um, this one requires a lot of buy-in. A lot of the things I am talking about here require a lot of buy-in at all levels in an organization. That can be hard. Um, but at um, Don't Panic Labs, I think it was maybe actually Doug that had the policy. or try, we're, not, we're not super rigid about anything, but we try never to schedule meetings in the afternoon, especially for the engineers. Um, and that's been huge to be speaking, have these nice four-hour blocks where you can actually work on something and not be interrupted. Um, Anytime you, this is, for, I think a lot of us get into this habit, and I'm very guilty of this myself, is thinking, oh, I'm a good multitasker. And I find myself at times thinking I can actually be a good multitasker. And I hear other people say they can be a good multitasker. Well, the, uh, well, the truth is none of us are good multitaskers. We all suck. So I highly recommend trying to get buy-in from other people in your organizations. Schedule your meetings in nice, coherent blocks. You can do meet mornings, afternoons, it doesn't really matter but try to give your engineers large amounts of time to work on, time to work on things. Uh, I know myself, if I'm bouncing between multiple things, it seems to take me 20, 30 minutes just to get back to where I was. And I think we've all experienced that. Uh, how many of us leave notepad windows on our desktop when we leave on Friday so when we come back on Monday we can see that list of, oh yeah, that's what I was working on. I'm assuming others here do that. Or a sticky note when you left, when you leave on Friday. Because when you come back on Monday, it's hard to remember what you're doing. But you have that problem every time you um, enter and exit out of something. I'm not just talking a three minute walk over here to get a drink or something, but these big meetings where your brain completely shifts to thinking about a whole different problem potentially and then having to come back. This one I think was a huge one for us at um, DPL, for me personally for enjoying what I do. 
Um, we have some meetings early in the morning, and then I can actually get some work done. Here's uh, two blocks, the one on the right over there. Um, that is a copy of Doug's schedule. That could be from any week. That's probably actually a good week for him because it's not all green. Uh, and then there's a, one on the left over here. That's from one of our engineers on one of our teams. Yeah, they have a few meetings. They tend to have these little blocks at the beginning of the day. We, we tend to do a stand-up early in the day for every team. And then they had one meeting, probably, I don't know what it was, it doesn't show, but probably some sort of design meeting one um, afternoon or something. Um, but that was a pretty good week for that engineer. He didn't get interrupted a lot. Um, so those sorts of schedules we should be really shooting for for our engineers, our lead engineers. Now that doesn't mean if you're working on something you can't go have a conversation with that person about that. Because a lot of times we're working on things together, but just these meetings often aren't about what you're working on this second. They're often about like, you know, doing design work for the next thing or trying to figure out how to solve something for a customer. Um, these meetings are essential, we need to have them. We just, it's, we're way better off if we can co-locate those meetings to potentially like all in the morning or at some time. This one um, is something we've really bought in early on at DPL. Um, uh, we, we have a ton of projects going on. Um, we do a, a lot of um, consulting type work. We have Beehive, we have Elite Form, we have some, some health stuff. We have a lot of things going on. And we knew we were gonna have a lot of things going on. Um, but we knew each project really wasn't gonna be that unique. It required us to revisit each one completely um, or do each one completely different. Each one wasn't its own unique snowflake. So we have an architecture pattern we, and a process, most importantly, for breaking down systems, for doing the design of our systems. Um, we follow that process on every system we do, and we end up with regenerating assets, just little architecture diagrams, that look very similar across all our projects. That um, has been huge for us, um, the, one of the items there, is it's fairly easy to take a developer from one project, or it's, take them from one project, put them on another one, show them the architecture diagrams, tell them what service they're gonna be implementing, and send them on their way. Um, we follow the same patterns, we follow the same um, ideas when we actually write our code. We tend to use dependency injection everywhere, tend to use only a few different dependency injection frameworks. We tend to keep everything very similar. And we've done this across a whole variety of um, projects. Elite Form, they're a motion capture um, or software that uses Kinex to, uh, for athletes lifting. That's very, very um, real time, very unique. Uh, in software, we use those same kind of patterns there. We use the same patterns on Beehive, which is more of a traditional, um, a lot of forms, a lot of data being injected into a system. The same patterns work in a lot of places. We do have to sometimes make some changes. We sometimes have to um, say, nope, for this system, we're gonna do it a little bit different. But in general, we haven't really experienced a lot of that. A lot of it has been more, as we do more and more iterations of it, we just kind of continue to refine our process to be better. Um, as we do each one of these, I think we always kind of look back and think we did, this worked really well on this project. Um, I'm going from a project where we um, kind of passed our, some state around what we were calling our switchboard. Um, we're gonna be using that on the next project. We just kind of, this worked well here, so we're gonna continue evolving that forward. Um, and that's, uh, really important, we have kind of this pool of people that communicate, we keep trying to evolve to doing our designs better. I don't think we got it nailed, but we keep making this better and better. Um, Fred Brooks, the um, author of Mythical Man Month um, from many years ago, 1975, I just really realized that's before I was born. Um, uh, he you know, mentions that the, maintaining that conceptual integrity was more important than uh, maintaining um, than, than delivering features, the, the exact features the users want. Um, I don't know if I'd go necessarily go that far. I think um, we often have to deliver what they want or need. Um, but maintaining that um, conceptual integrity, maintaining a system that makes sense um, from, the, from all pieces of it is essential for your software. And we've, been, we've bought into that hard and that's been, I think, really improved our enjoyment of so writing software. And I think it's really nice when you can move people from one area to another. You can go, we don't all have our little walled garden where I'm like the um, integration guy and I'm the UI guy. We really try to bounce everybody around and everything should look and feel very similar. 
Uh, Martin Fowler, this is from him, the design stamina hypothesis. I want lo the last slide I had up there is going to, you know, kind of argue we do need to do some design. I think a common thing you'll run into, and I know I've ran into it many times, is there's a soft um, push not to do um, design within organizations. Certain people don't want to. We just got to get going. Just got to get going. Um, and I think um, that design payoff line, like where does where does it um, start to pay off? Um, I think that you know it's probably in the orders of you know like weeks. If you're doing any project that takes more than a few weeks, you're probably better off doing some design for it. Um, in the case of many of the things we're working on, it's like often a few month adventure on a project at the very least. It's most certainly worth spending that time to do the design so we can all have an enjoyable experience working on that code. Um, one last or another um, big thing that contributes to the fun is actually do testing. This is one of those things uh, called out for the lead engineer to ensure everybody's doing. Um, some of my most enjoyable software ever writing myself, this is the way I like to write software, is write unit tests and write software, and I enjoy it. Um, we, Doug and I, had a previous life, worked on a company where there was a product that was just a train wreck to deploy, train wreck to write software on. We hated it, and it continually just kept biting us. Eventually, we took the, we kind of almost or very reluctantly, we decided we need to rewrite it. Um, we didn't really want to rewrite it. It was an essential piece of software for the company, um, but we did. And when we were rewriting it, we followed, uh, we, we went full test of everything. We tested everything. Every time we ran into an issue, we wrote a test for it, tested the heck out of it. That was some of the most enjoyable software I've ever written. And it, even after, and we got it done, and I'm not kidding, we basically got it done, and a few days later, the old system came crashing down around us, so we almost, we just kind of had to run the new one out. It was a little scary running something out, but we had tests for all the cases, um, for all the data we knew about, and it worked and worked fine. And having that kind of um, test there, we continued to evolve that system. We'd find other edge cases or find other things it needed to do. It was very enjoyable working in that world. I just wrote some unit tests, um, and, or wrote some unit tests, wrote some code, deployed it, and it was all fine and dandy, and that was a blast to work on. And it was an area of a system where before the, that situation, it was absolutely miserable. Uh, when, I first, when I first started that job, I remember got there, the world was great, new job, everything's fun, we're all having a good time, and then that system fell apart. And I remember just weeks of hell. Uh, but just having that testability, and part of that was the stress of the system. It was essential to what they were, that company was doing. Uh, but having those unit tests and stuff made de deploying it and deploying new versions incredibly fun. Go off. One last thing I think is huge, uh, and we didn't do this in the very, very early days of um, Nebraska Global. As I said, we're kind of we're continuing to evolve. Um, code reviews I think used to be kind of difficult um, back in like the TFS days. You could do code reviews, or you could look at systems, but the whole branching and merging wasn't there. It was painful. So it often I'd say things slip through, especially when you're under um, distress trying to get a release out the door. It was just it became kind of one of the things that slipped through. Well, I think with GitHub and pull requests, I don't think really that, um, that excuse exists anymore. There's almost no reason to check straight into master. Doing code reviews is so easy and painless. I think always do it. And you find a ton of little problems that will come up and bite you later. Um, in Steve McConnell's book, Code Complete, um, he references like, what are some of the best ways to improve quality? And he kind of has a whole bunch of layered options for that. There's unit testing, there, uh, um, there's actually, you know, like QA type work. But the one he said improved your quality the most was just doing code reviews. And I think in that book he was advocating more of a formal code review, if I remember. But it was, you know, he was advocating for code reviews is the best way to improve code um, quality. And I do think having a higher quality code base most certainly improves everyone's enjoyable, the enjoyment of working in it. None of us going in like going into a system where we know, one, we're, we're going to have to make some changes, and two, we're not going to know if they're going to work. Keep maintaining that conceptual design, maintaining the, for, and forcing everyone to write unit tests for everything, it will be a more enjoyable solution to work in. Um, one other one we're from early on of Nebraska Global, um, I've been a big fan of, we're continuing to evolve here, where we're actually doing, um, and I highly adv advise everyone does runs your full unit test suite against every pull request that's um, ran out there, even before you merge them. 
Um, I think this is an area where um, you just will have so much more confidence in your code and co more confidence that things work. It's very easy to make something that works on my machine, uh, but it's great when it, you, feel, you feel great when it works on the build server. Um, getting this in gives you a lot more confidence as an engineer. Um, and that other system I was talking about where the world, everything is falling apart, there wasn't any continuous integration system. There were no unit tests that ran. And we did get nightly um, calls. Some people here in the audience know Harry Waguna. Um, he's a great guy. Uh, love Harry. We work with him still to this day. If I see his name come across my phone to this day, I bet my blood pressure goes up 10 points. Because he used to be the person that would always call me and tell me when there was some d um, big problem with the system. And that, that probably still lingers to this day. If he calls me right, right now, it'll, my stress most certainly will go up. Um, where's my phone there? Um, and then the one last thing is this kind of, I think, helps to avoid the broken window syndrome. We often end up in these situations where, oh, the whole system kind of has problems, or people make almost jokes about an area of a system, or maybe the system as a whole. Just the whole thing's got problems. Those sorts of systems none of us want to work on. We want to avoid those. Uh, make sure it's all good all the time. One, such, one unit test kind of starts failing. Before you know it, you'll end up with a system where there's always five or six unit tests failing. Before you know it, you'll end up with 20, 30 unit tests failing, and the unit tests really have no value. Um, do continuous integration. Do it on all your pull requests. Um, you'll, you'll be able to sleep better at night. Um, one last thing we did, and this was a huge change from things we've done pre at previous companies, I think personally, for me, is a huge uh, win for my enjoyment of writing software, is always try to ensure your developers can do all their work without communicating, within, or without running everything that they need to on their machine. This requires uh, some changes to your software off, off, often, and when you're doing your system design, you, you often need to plan for this. Sometimes you have to create like a mock version of a service because you can't reach out to a service that's running somewhere else. You need to do that early on in your projects when you start. And if you're not that way now, look at what would we need to change so we could do this this way. Now, this isn't going to work for every little um, piece of a system, but it often works for more than you realize. In the case of a lot of the software, um, don't panic labs, we often are communicating with a SQL Server backend, so we're, all the developers develop against SQL Express locally. Um, we use some sort of database change um, control to, so they can upgrade their database to some version. In the case of um, Beehive, Anne's done some talks, one of the engineers on there, she was here last year. We have a very complicated system that can actually take your machine and make it into, really quickly, just with a little command line argument, make it into any of our customers' databases. Um, that's not always going to be possible. In the case of um, Beehive, that company deals with government data and they tend not to have huge requirements over the security of their data. They tend to be fairly free with giving out their data, so that's easier to work with, and they don't have the uh, HIPAA-type re um, regulations. If you're working in a, in a uh, healthcare system, some of these things might become more difficult. But really strive for every developer can run on their own machine. You should be able to do development if you're stuck on an airplane for a while without Wi-Fi. That should be one of your goals. Or you should be able to go to a coffee shop. If you want to get away for an afternoon, you should be able to go to Scooters or Starbucks or wherever you like to get um, caffeine and work for a few hours. And you shouldn't need to get on the network. Although, I don't know how we develop without Stack Overflow. I think it was down this morning. It was very, very concerning. Uh, I was very stressed. Uh, and you going to finish or I'm finishing? OK, I'm finishing. Um, this is a matrix of a whole bunch of text, and it probably makes some sense if you could see it. So if you wish, you can come really close, but I would advise against it. I'd probably smell. Um, but you can look up there. We, um, we took those areas across the top. Oh, I can see it here. Took those areas across the top, and then the, all the things we do on the, bot, on the left, and kind of point out which ones uh, help certain areas. These slides, as Doug said, will be available after this, so you can come back and look at this if you wish to check whether we put real text in there or if that is actually just Greek text. You'll be able to figure that out. Um, one thing I would say is, uh, or I've said a couple times here, we don't think we've got it nailed. I think we can continue to improve that. As that early slide showed, we had that um, happy face and the frowny face. We both still have a happy and a frowny face. I think our happy face is bigger. Um, that's our effective KPI for this. Um, 
and we're, we continue to make that, try to make that frowny face smaller. We're continuing to evolve there. Um, and it takes a lot of people. Um, it takes management wanting to be, make things enjoyable. It takes engineers wanting to make things enjoyable. It takes project managers and everybody wanting um, to continue to evolve this pla your place of work to a spot where people want to be during the day. Um, I don't think there's any one thing. There's not like, but you do system design, that'll make it, that'll solve it. You do unit testing, that'll solve it. Um, I think it's a, it really requires a combination, kind of a layered approach to this to get there. Um, and I think a lot of places kind of start with the, we'll do agile and that's gonna solve it. That's gonna make everybody better. That's gonna solve these problems. Agile is essential. I really like the, we, in our case, many, many of our projects work on weekly releases. I really love the get features quickly to, a, um, to the product owners or to the, um, out to the customers, if you have customers. I think that's great for improving the overall experience. I think developers love it when their stuff actually makes it to production. Um, and I know we, many of us have worked on stuff where we do six months of development and it's four months later before it's out there. We, it's really great to work on stuff where you develop it one week and the next week it's in a customer's hands. I think that really shortens the time, the turnaround there, and really provides a better um, link between what you're developing and what your customers actually need. And we constantly try to um, improve our practices and constantly reviewing. We're all constantly challenging, should we be doing it this way, should we not? And that doesn't just come down to software. I think a lot of engineers, we're all pretty good at having the conversation. Well, should we be using Knockout? Should we be using Angular? I don't know. Um, and then you can get in those nice holy wars between the Knockout people and the Angular people. And they, it gets really, really violent. Um, but I think we also have to constantly look at what are we doing from a process? What are we doing from design as well? It's just not technology. And often in cases of what makes um, working in software isn't the technology. You can make Angular or Knockout a lot of fun to work in. It comes down to who you're working on, how you're working on it, how well you've designed it, how well you've set it up. Um, those sorts of things you have to do early on. You have to have a culture that kind of re rewards or ex accepts those. Um, and as I said, how do we, uh, or last slide here, last little bit, how do we actually measure fundability in the workplace? Well, we're working on it. Um, um, and I still think, you know, as I, this other one says here, I mentioned web technologies, we still feel pain. Um, we're really good at writing unit tests for our business logic. We're really good at writing unit tests in our C-sharp code. In those areas, we tend to love working in. They tend to be easy um, for us to get in and make changes quickly. We're still evolving on the website. We're not perfect there. Um, Beehive, we finally went through and did kind of a restructure of our WPF piece using our architecture patterns on the WPF app itself. And I think we came to something that was way more enjoyable to work on, but I still think we can get a lot better. Uh, so it's just kind of, it's a, we have to continue to push for making things better. And I think we, and I hope all you do as well. Your many cases, you're probably the leaders of your companies, either the developer, development leads, or the project managers, and you guys really kind of need to take it upon yourselves to ensure that everybody has a good time. If they're having a good time, you're probably having a better time. Um, so really try to make sure everyone has a good time. All right. I'm done. Um, anything else? Questions? I'd say it all depends on context. If it's a, as a, a more junior engineer working on something, we're probably going to interact more. 
Um, a lot of times when we do stand up a new system, we do a lot of the architecture up front, and a lot of things after that tend to be just changes to the existing boxes. They tend to be um, fairly obvious where the changes are. But that's not always the case. Every once in a while, we do tear up a lot of road and make big changes. And at those points, we will go in and do uh, more architecture. Uh, we probably, uh, in general, a lot across um, Don't Panic Labs, Nebraska Global, we're maybe not tracking things down to the hour. That some places track things too. So uh, sometimes we'll just probably put it under. We have this story, and we just put maybe a design task sometimes on them. But we're not often not tracking at that level. Yeah. How, uh, how would you say uh, going into the test driven development has, uh, would you say, it's positively impacted your? Uh, your yeah. So the next question was, do we think test driven development is how, how is it positively impacted? Um, our design and our, I'd say if, there, if, if, if there's one thing you could do to really make a significant impact to the quality of your system, it is to do test-driven design. It is to write all of your classes or services as to be unit testable in isolation. I think it, that gets you 80% of the way there to using really solid um, design principles and best practices. It's going to decouple your code base. It's going to force you to kind of look at the, these classes of services from a consumption model. I'm looking at. I know that when, I, when I'm writing, literally, I'm, I'm writing a method in an interface. I'm thinking about the parameters I'm passing into this method. I'm thinking about how am I going to test this? How am I going to create the, the, the structure to test that? That's really a powerful change in the way you think about your code. Because traditionally, I've been thinking more about the inside of that class as opposed to the consumers of that class. So um, it's probably hard to overstate how big an impact that has had on not just the system design, but also then down the road in terms of maintainability, in terms of you have built-in documentation on how the code works and how it's intended to be used by just reading the unit tests. I mean, I could, you could probably go on and on about the impact of that. So yeah, I'd say, man, you are like 80% of the way there, wherever there is, you know, Nirvana. If you could just devote yourself to doing test driven design within your systems. So you're, do we kind of prepare a couple of sprints before for work that's coming down the road? Um, that probably depends. Um, I'd say for things that are like if we're adding brand new modules to a system, I'm pretty sure they're spending some time leading up to that. A lot of times, we if it's very UI UX driven, we kind of demand that that UI UX stuff gets designed well in advance before it gets handed off to developers because a lot of times that uncovers some complexity or some hidden assumptions within the system that we don't want to be discovering those during the sprint. So we're trying to uncover a lot of that stuff early on. So yes, I think that happens when appropriate. And I think we can, we're pretty good at kind of recognizing that. And I think you would be too. You'd say, you'd look at this and say, this seems like a big ball of goo. I don't understand what this thing is. Uh, before we just jump in here and start slinging code, maybe we can kind of defer that a little bit. Let's spend a little bit of time working through the design. How are we actually going to map this against our design? Yes. As far as other things that are too. That I think track too. from other things that detract from fundability that you just can't see the way from. Say it again. Things are things that are not fun that you can't get away from. Oh, yeah. I mean, like I said, I don't. <sighs> well, you know, I remember uh, I met the race used to bring in these guys that were agile coaches. Um, uh, Nate, one of these guys, uh, I can't remember his name. He was actually one of the signers of the Agile Manifesto. And I remember one of the students asked him in a, in a thing, he's like, well, what do you do about, what do you tell people when the software's going to be ready? It's like, he's like, you just tell them it's going to be ready when it's ready. And I kept thinking, this guy's living in a dream world. I don't know what he's thinking. I mean, the idea that there aren't business requirements in terms of when something needs to be available, I can't get away from that. That's kind of reality. I mean, maybe some of us work in a world where I can actually deliver, do, deliver software whenever I want to. But, so that, I think that stuff always creates, I wouldn't say that's, 
I don't want to say it's a pain point, but it is a, it is a pressure point on, on what you're trying to do. If you have, you know, you have resources, you have requirements, and you have timeline. And if any one or two of those things are fixed, it does put pressure on your system. Sometimes you have to make trade-offs. Some, I talk about managing technical debt. Maybe sometimes the pressure of the schedule is requiring that we're, we're not able to do some of these things that we would normally do. But I think what we've done is we've kind of created a framework where we recognize that. Maybe we can plan to deal with that later, you know. But, um, I mean, that's just maybe one example. This stuff, you know, I, I'd love to tell you that we never have problems with our releases. I'd love to tell you we never have hot fixes. That's just not true. You're still going to have that. But, but it's rare, I will tell you. It's really rare. Um, so if we have, if, I don't know how many hot fixes do you think we had last year? Maybe a handful? Yes, less than ten? Five? Five in here. Um, so that it, stuff happens, but it's, it's, it's not realistic to think we're going to eliminate that stuff. But if that becomes the exception rather than the rule, then that has a dramatic thing. Sprint one, 
there is none of that infrastructure we have to set up. Everything is there, ready to go, and everybody can kind of just follow the same solution. So does that kind of answer that question a little bit? Kind of add one, one more thing to that. A lot of times we include as many people as possible in those as well, especially if we know who the team's going to be. So a little bit while we're doing some of these, well, one, we usually have some sort of kickoff meeting. So we do kind of walk through the architecture, walk through the screens, kind of walk through the solution. But I think also we include a lot of those people in, the, in those design stuff, in those decisions as well. So they kind of have that sense of it from early on. Um, so hopefully they're not coming in completely blindsided. Now, it doesn't always work that way because sometimes people are coming off one project onto another one and they didn't really have that opportunity. But we try to include people if we can. That'd be early on as well. Yeah, the only time they probably get together formally is for probably spring planning. But then, you know, we have the luxury that we, people are pretty accessible, so they're pretty available. So it's pretty common to have that, those conversations kind of happening ad hoc or as necessary. People are going to ask a question. Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting that um, it doesn't take much physical separation to really impact that. Like, me and I on a different floor from the rest of our company. And sometimes it feels like, you know, when you have an environment where everybody's used to being able to just kind of look, you know, look 10 feet away and see the person I need to talk to, when that person has to be on another floor, it does create challenges. I want to say one on that one as well. It depends a little bit on the life cycle of a product. Um, DPLs is often standing up V1s of stuff or the very early versions, MVPs of stuff. Um, so there's a lot of that in it. Um, involvement on all sides during the design of a system and a lot of those during kind of iteration planning we're showing what's what's been built kind of interacting with them at that point in the case of beehive where it's more of a product that's been out there for a long, long time we actually had eventually kind of came to we had one person that was kind of the go-to for random one you know daily questions um, from them as opposed to having like support or sales needing necessarily to funnel or send a shotgun to everyone. We kind of tried to funnel those questions through a particular person and almost during what we called office hours, during the time, a certain time of the day to eliminate the constant chatter that can come up. Because it's pretty easy to start, to just let things start to go to a uh, point where there's just, everybody's always talking to everybody, constantly interrupting. So we tried funneling that down to a particular person, particular times. And that worked fairly well for us. Now, there's always going to have to be some violations of that. If uh, something's really, really bad happening in production right now, you obviously kind of have to break that. But I'd say you also want to live in a world where things don't go really bad in production very often. So you shouldn't have that problem. Yeah, that's a bit. There's probably quite a few people here that are kind of doing this. This is something we started um, at Sonic back in the 2000s was like the chance point. This was particularly a problem for us to support. Like if somebody was downstairs and they had a support question, they played out and talked to whoever they liked, you know, their favorite person or somebody who no one ever talked to me. Yeah, and nobody ever talked to me So I didn't realize this was a problem. Yeah. Right? So yeah, so it became very much a distraction. So we, we went into a, uh, a process where, like Jeff was saying, we designated this is your point of contact person for this week. You can interrupt them however you want. That's the only person you can go to. If they have to go talk to another developer period, that's fine. They, they can um, eventually, I think the person we had there just kind of liked that job so much, they just stuck in that permanently and just liked doing that support stuff. Um, so that's, that, we didn't really talk about that, but that's also kind of protecting that major schedule, is to say, hey, there can be outside people that can be kind of blowing up some of the productivity. All right, so we'll, we'll stick around here. We've got some stickers there on for this little giveaway here in case you're interested. Uh, thanks for coming and uh, we'll stick around here if you have other questions.